And thank you very much for inviting me to be here today um, to give this um, workshop. It's not going to be about me, it's going to be about all of us. Um, as Deb mentioned, I am a coach. I used to work with Deb many moons ago in Pfizer. I worked for Pfizer for 24 years, and much of that was in oncology, and some of it was actually with um, prosotinib and uh, without positive um, patients, and also in uh, improving um, treatment pathways as well. Um, and then I discovered coaching, and I loved it, and I coach people in the NHS, I coach um, management and consultants, and I also um, coach with about four different cancer charities. And the reason I love it is because I really love seeing people thrive. I really love seeing people making the most of what they have and their strengths, um, their values. And I talk a lot about meaning and purpose. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, so we're going to do a, a few exercises. We're going to play around and be a little bit creative. Um, and we're going to look at a few questions and pose a few questions because I don't have all of the answers on this. I'm going to share you what I know or what I've learned and what I know. But this is lifelong work. Um, I'm going to press the button, am I? Um, so this was a question, well actually it was a statement that Deb posed and I thought no, let's turn this into a question. How do we live in the present with lung cancer? And some of what we're going to talk about today is in, it might be a bit triggering, so anybody who wants to take some time out please do, but we're going to be doing some exercises where it's your chance to be heard, it's your chance to listen. Um, and we're going to share some experiences. So I thought, well, who do we know in the room who really embodies living in the moment, living in the present? <laughs> some, I think there's somebody here that, that is pretty good at this. If you go on Deb's Facebook page, it is full of moments, living in the moment living in the present. Was anybody at the Sapphire Ball? Yay! Sweet Carol! <laughs> do, do, do. Um, and this is, this is um, connecting really with, with the mission of your, your charity, living, patients living their best lives. So how do we do that when, you know, we're, we're living with what's facing us? So I just want to share a story of something that's just happened to me with Sandra. Sandra and I, ne next door, you might have heard there's a little bit of music going on next door. And there is a church service going on next door. And they were playing music. So Sandra and I, we just popped in around the back there. And um, it was amazing, wasn't it, Sandra? And it was people living in the moment. And they were singing, and they were playing instruments, and they were absolutely at one with that, with that environment. So what does it mean to live in the moment? Now, I've picked a few of things that I connect with, but this isn't about me, it's about you. What are your moments? What are the times when you've been absolutely present? The times when you've not even needed to pick up your mobile phone because you know that that memory is going to live with you in here forever. Are they big moments? Are they small moments? Are there moments when you're all together? Are they moments when you might be on your own? You might be in nature. You might be just picking up a leaf. The leaves are turning at the moment. What does that signify for you? Being in nature, being grounded, being in the environment, being at one. 
So there are a few, a few images there. I, I was driving along the other day, and um, I saw this guy. The sun was shining. It was one of those brilliant hot days, and it was a young man. And I was in the car, and he was on his, his, his bike, his bicycle. And it was the sun was beating down. He had his top off. He was on his bike, and he had his hands off the wheel. And he was screaming down this hill. And I thought, there's a guy living in the moment, living in the present. And he was just completely connected. You know, he could feel the sun, he could feel the wind going past him. He was absolutely living it. So here are a few other things, a few other images. But what I'd like you to do is think about your own times, your own moments. And I'm going to ask you to get into pairs. So this is the first of the little exercises I'm going to invite you to um, engage in. I'd like you to get into pairs or threes, depending on the numbers in your tables. And I'd like you to think of that moment. It might be even this weekend where it's happened, when you've all been together, or something that's happened fairly recently, when you can think of that it was a moment in time, it was a moment when you were fully present. So I'd like you to get into pairs. I'd like you to write that moment down on the post-it. And then I'd like you to spend a few minutes each. One person will describe what that moment was to the other person. And you'll listen without interrupting. And then you'll, you'll swap over. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, I'd like to ask you if you could put your post-its onto the um, flip chart paper, but I'd also like to ask, would anybody like to share what their moments or their moment is? There are some quite diverse and lovely moments here. Would anybody like to share? Go on, Deb. Thank you, Deb. And I know that lots there are lots more. Would anybody else like to share? I've heard can acorns. I, There's a lady. Can I, can I go next? Go on, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> you go, Graham. The floor's yours. Deb and I sometimes have really psychic thoughts together. <laughs> and I will write down and read out what I've written here. Pop said in France, Deb and sister. And he said she was singing and having a great time. And that's amazing that she just done that exactly at the same moment I wrote down. It was absolutely wonderful as a father watching the two of them together and being really happy together. The alcohol did not come <laughs> Graham, what synergy there. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? There's a lady. The lady here.
Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I can't remember your name, sorry. What was your name? What was your name? Rini. Rini. So Rini mentioned their family, nature. Um, your, was it your cats? Um, you know, your, your animals. And nature figures quite a lot, I think, you know, um, and the people that you're with. There's another lady there. you mentioned there it's it's you're not ill you're just what's what's your name a d d it's a time when d is is d not d without positive arms more cell lung cancer but d thank you anybody else gentlemen there I love how you know all the names. <laughs> going through your mind in that moment? <laughs> the squeaky bum moment then. Absolutely in the moment and, and an expected twist to that as well. So really heightening the senses. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that. So you can see that we all have these moments and they're all very different because we are all very different we're all very different the thing that unites us is is our positive non-small cell lung cancer I can't even say it anymore but the fact also is that we are all very different we're individual human beings and we have other things going on in our lives as well so um, if you could go back in time a year, what advice would you give to your younger self about living in the moment? So if you could time travel, what would you spend more time on? What would you spend less time on? What would you pay more attention to? What would you pay less attention to? What would you give your energy to? or not. Anybody want to contribute? Anybody have any ideas on what they might do differently? Any advice? So you, you're, you're really conscious of being in that moment. 
and you've done that. You've, that sounds like a practice, something that you practice. Mm. Thank you. So putting it into a sense of proportion, compartmentalizing. Thank you. Anybody else? Two gentlemen here. Do you want to go first? <laughs> nice pullback there, I like that. <laughs> so interesting, yeah, exercising more, not so much on um, social media, but um, yeah, that thing about people, um, and that's your choice, you're in control of that, and you don't know what's going on with them either, and you're not responsible for them. It's not necessarily because they don't care, it's just sometimes because they don't know how to communicate. Yes. Thank you. And there was something, this gentleman? Um, I've been on this sort of, sort of mental health journey in the last six, seven months. Sort of horizontal being physically really unwell, so even when I was just doing some yoga. And um, everything just came to a head.
Yeah, and that, that can be the case. And thank you for highlighting that, that maybe asking for help a little bit earlier than we, you know, often we sit on these things. And um, thank you for highlighting that there is a lot of help out there. But we're not always in the right place sometimes to ask for that help, or we see that asking for help maybe is, you know, it's not who we are, but actually it's, it's a sign of, of strength and of moving forward. So thank you for sharing that. That was really helpful. So what stops us from living in the moment? Interruptions. What someone just said. Money. And what is it about money? So money, money, financial worries. Busy. What do you mean by being busy? Well, work is too much. <laughs> it stops you from being in the moment because you're, yeah. you're, yeah. Because you're having to earn some money to pay your bills. Yeah. So financial worries. Yeah. Anything else? The fear of the unknown. What do we not know? What do we not know what we don't know? Yeah, thank you. The fear of the unknown. Anything else? Thinking, yeah. Do you ever go to sleep at night and you just can't turn off that little brain? Regretting the past. Yeah. Past is difficult, isn't it? Do you want to tell us more about that? You don't know how you're going to feel on the day. Thank you. Deb.
So Deb, no, thank you, Deb. Deb makes an interesting point. And I think it's also the fact that we are all very individual. And I, I mentioned to somebody earlier on, I had an aunt, you may have heard, you know, in the work environment, well, let's manage this like you were going to get run over by a bus tomorrow. Well, my aunt did get run over by a bus, and instantly... It wasn't just her life that changed, but everybody around her changed. Now, she could not have foreseen that. And I'm not saying that we all live our lives like that, but that may be why part of the reason I'm drawn to, to doing this work, because there aren't any guarantees, and it is uncertain. But how do we live our lives in that kind of environment? The other thing is understanding We've talked about anxiety. What's the difference between fear and anxiety? Because we do, somebody mentioned about, you know, not sweating the small stuff. So how do we know what the small stuff is? And how do we stop that small stuff and that anxiety creeping in? You know, the anxiety of booking a holiday and not knowing whether you can go on that holiday. You know, that's, they're real feelings and they're real emotions. And actually understanding what we're feeling can be very helpful. So, I mentioned fear and anxiety. Does anybody want to have a stab at what the difference is between fear and anxiety? Gentlemen there. Uh, Do you know, I'm so pleased you said that because I'm not entirely sure myself. I'm going to have a stab at it too. So thank you. <laughs> so just say that again. <laughs> it's so you're overthinking. Okay. And I guess... The way I've, I've seen it described is fear is about what now. So it's right up, right up in your grill. It's right up. It's happening now. It's that time when you have your diagnosis. I bet there are a few people that can forget that day. But interestingly, I bet it's interesting things that you remember about that day. Maybe the wallpaper, what was on the desk, not necessarily what was said. And we'll come on to that later on. That fear, it's that shark right up in your face. It's not lurking down below and you don't know what's happening. It's right there up in your face. What do I have to do now? I've just lost my license. What am I going to do right now? You know, I've just um, had a really bad argument with my partner and I, or I've just had a really massive bill. And it's something that's happening right now that we have to face. Whereas anxiety... It's often around the what if, the what if moments, and I'm, I'm worried about what if this happens. It hasn't actually happened, but it might do.
It's one way of looking at it. Yeah, I think there are, you know, there are various different um, definitions. The thing is, they are real feelings and real emotions. But if we can get a handle on whether we're worried about something that we can do something about, or if we're worried about something that we, we definitely need to do something about, it can be quite helpful. So this was, for me, what represented fear. Up in your face, Darth Vader, wave, waving his lightsaber. You've got to do something about that. That's fear. And then I put this little fella up because um, somebody I know, she, she calls that little voice in her head, that little voice that says, I don't know if you can go to that, that wedding or that holiday because I don't know if you're going to be well enough. This little voice. Does anybody else have a little voice like this? I'll bet you all have one, whether you know it or not. Anyway, this friend, she calls hers Beetlejuice. It's the one that says, no, don't do any exercise today. It's the one that says, grab those cakes and have some more cakes tomorrow and have the ice cream and that three bags of crisps. It's, it's that voice. We all have it. It's that internal dialogue that's going on. It's the internal dialogue that says, oh, I've got this weekend coming up. It's a conference. I'm not going to know anyone. What am I going to say to anyone? I don't know anyone. What am I going to do? I don't know where I'm going. It's that voice. Beetlejuice voice, the anxiety voice. So that's sort of how I've described them. And then I didn't put up a real picture of a shark because I watch way too many YouTube videos of sharks. And I love sea swimming. I live near the beach. I go swimming. I live um, in Swanage. So very often um, in the week, I'll go several times a week. And lots of people like to go along the beach. I like to go out. I, like Baz Luhrmann says, I like to scare myself every day. So I go out and I'm swimming. I can feel my breathing going, my heart's going. Oh, you can hear, feel that on the um. And then I, I feel something brush against my leg. It's like, all right, yeah, okay. I start swimming a bit faster. And then there's a massive shadow there and I'm thinking, oh God, what's that? And I'm, I'm quite way out by now. And then the cloud goes over and the sun's gone. And um, I'm really swimming quite hard. And then I say to myself, Jane, there haven't been any sharks sighted this year, let alone great whites. <laughs> so, you know, just get, just get a grip of yourself. Okay. So there haven't even been any sharks noted today. No, no. So what could that have been that was brushing your leg? It could just have been me just doing my funny swim stroke. It could have been a bit of seaweed. Yes, now you're trying to put your rational brain in there. Okay, okay, okay. And then I start breathing, counting. Okay, okay. You've got this, Jane, you've got this. And then I get up to the outer mark and then I swim back and I see all the people on the shore and Breathing starts going down and heart rate's going down. And I've talked myself back down. So sometimes that's just the process that we have to do. Are we talking about facts? Are we talking about our thoughts? Just thinking about that anxiety. Is it fear? Is it anxiety? Are they real facts or are they thoughts? And that's not to say that thoughts are unimportant because they are very important. So I'll leave that with you. Thinking patterns. So that leads me on. There are lots of different thinking patterns that we have. The most common in the cancer situation is around catastrophizing. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? You go for your consultant's appointment. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? And they're going to tell you bad news. And our brain automatically skips there because that's our survival instinct. We have to eliminate the threat. We're automatically going to the worst case scenario. It might be if you ever had a phone ring at, I don't know, nine o'clock at night. Mm, what's that? Someone's ringing with bad news. So 
Does anybody have any examples they want to share of catastrophizing? Scanxiety. Yeah. So thinking about the worst that can happen. <coughs> yeah. So actually going into that place, some, I think there is a Star Wars um, analogy. It's around um, in the cave is the treasure that you seek. Sometimes going into that dark place and facing your fears, sometimes writing. Does anybody keep a journal or a diary? Sesha at the back. So writing down your fears, being able to get your thoughts out of your head onto the page can be quite a helpful exercise. So thinking about that catastrophizing, knowing when you're catastrophizing, being aware of that can help you just be in that moment. Is it something that I need to give attention to, or is it my mind running away with myself? So thinking about the catastrophizing, have you got all the facts? Do you know all the facts? Because otherwise, are you MSUing, like my husband would say? Are you making shit up? <laughs> um, because that's what our brain likes to do. The other thought pattern is around should, ought to, and must language. How often do we think, you know, I, I should feel better. I must put that washing out. I must meet that friend. I must go and run a marathon, because him next door, he's running a marathon. And what, what does that language do to ourselves? There's lots of pressure on us, isn't it? And is that because we're comparing our experience with somebody else's and we think, well, we should be doing that? So when you find yourself using those words, just maybe check and say, actually, am I using should and ought to and could have, should have, yeah, should, must language? Do I need to be a little bit kinder to myself? Look at my friend. So this is a lovely Taz. Having a little think about his thinking patterns. And then we've got fight, flight, freeze, fawn um, response. This goes back, this is our very ancient um, Stone Age survival. Um, instinct. And in those days, um, the saber-toothed tiger or the woolly mammoth would come along. We would either fight it, we'd either run away from it, we'd either freeze on the spot and hope it hadn't noticed us, or we would say, hello, Mr. Woolly Mammoth, you're really looking gorgeous today. And what was, you know, what we did then was we would go out, we'd fight the woolly bear, the woolly mammoth, we would then go back to the cave. We would then have a lovely fire, a lovely meal like we had last night. We'd tell a few stories, do a few cave paintings, dance around the fire, have a little snooze. We were never meant to be fighting the woolly mammoth or the woolly bear all of the time. So the modern day version of those are the fight, flight, freeze, fawn response, as I mentioned. So fighting is that anger that sometimes when we first have that um, diagnosis, that, you know, that anger, why me? Um, it can be around control. The flight can often be around um, perfectionism, busyness, which, and sometimes they're interchangeable with all of these. Freeze can often be around not being able to make decisions, brain fog, which I think we all pretty much experience at some time. 
And then the fawning is around people pleasing and maybe not putting our needs first. So those are the modern day um, versions of fighting the bear outside the cave. The other effect of fight, flight, and fawn is the physiological response it has on our body. When we're in fight, fight, and fawn, we have a, a range of um, chemicals that are coursing through our bodies, anything from testosterone, cortisol. If you've ever had um, a moment you can feel, if you've ever been in, you're waiting for a space to get into the car park to have your scan and somebody whips into that space, Ooh! you feel that surge, yanks your chain, that's your amygdala hijack. It happens in an instant. So you've got all of these chemicals coursing around your brain And the brain isn't able to think rationally because all the oxygen is going to your muscles to get ready to fight or run. It's not going up here to think. So we end up looking a little bit like Taz. So when you're, this is, can be your early warning system the physiological effect of this can also be things like, you know, it'll affect your, your, um, your, your gastric um, uh, rest and digest. So it could mean that, you know, you get constipated. It could mean that you get breathless. It could mean that you shallow breathing, quick breathing. It could be your heart rate going. It could be your blood pressure going up. Sounds familiar? Some of these things are similar to the side effects that you, you might be experiencing. And I'm not saying this is all down to fight and flight, but it's not really going to help if you're already dealing with those things already. So it's just thinking about what's happening to my body. Is my body telling me something? You might be feeling okay, but your mouth is dry, your heart's starting to go. And they're the early warning signals, possibly that your amygdala is going into this fight or flight. And the thing is, often with cancer, you can be in that state much of the time. It's a little bit like an alarm on a car. And it's going all the time. So how do we turn it off? Because boy, is it a relief when we turn it off. So... What's happening there in our brain when that amygdala goes off is it's our very primal part of our brain. It's very deep-seated. It's been evolved over many years since the Stone Age. It's about protect. It's about protecting me. The opposite of that is connect. So when we are able to access our prefrontal cortex and our thinking, rational part of our brain, we then start producing lovely things like serotonin and oxytocin, the love hormones. If you go to a wedding, you get an abundance of those. And we're able to think a little bit more clearly and make decisions a little bit more clearly. We start thinking about we. You might think about this in maybe some of your conversations, maybe some of your relationships, which are really important to us. But in the moment, it's, you know, we snap. So just giving ourselves a little moment to pause can be really helpful. So mind that gap. There's the thinking Taz. And a little um, quote from Viktor Frankl. He's the Holocaust survivor who went on to be um, an eminent um, psychologist. And he talks about between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. We don't choose to have cancer, but we can choose how we respond to it. So, what can I control and what can't I control? I think this gentleman here mentioned some of this before. I should have brought my other glasses now. I can't read it all. Um, we talked about the opinions of others. 
Do we have control over that? The actions of others. The future. The past. What happens around me? Brexit, COVID, Ukraine, green dying. Do we have any control over that? No. What other people think of me? The outcome of my efforts. And how others take care of themselves. As much as we want people to, particularly those that we love, to be able to take care of themselves or, or do the things that we know are good for them, can we live their lives for them? We can't always. And we want them to take care of themselves, but actually, they need to take care of themselves. Just before I move on, the worry tree is a technique. It's, it's around deciding what I can control, what I can't control. Can I do something about it? A friend once said to me, in, uh, if I've been worrying about something for 48 hours, I'll do something about it in 24. This is um, on the NHS. It's an NHS app, and you can use it as a practical tool if you just want to download something from your mind. Is it something that you can do something about? Can I make a plan? So, thinking about what we've just digested, we can either react, like Taz, or we can respond. And the difference is tuning in, it's choosing, do I go with that first gut reaction, literally, or do I just take a moment? And it might be you're with your oncologist, and he's saying, well, we've got all this range of you know, things that we can do. We've got these new treatments. I've got some research. I've got a trial. What would you like to do? And your brain goes, mm, I don't know. It's a lot to take in. So there are things that you can do and say. You can say, that's great. Can you just give me a moment? Can I just think about it? Just let your brain have a little reset, a pause, a breath. We heard from Jordan earlier on how important a breath is. And just get curious about what's going on for you, what's going on for other people. Ooh, Taz seems to have said something. Okay, um, so why is self-soothing important? Self-soothing is around when that alarm is going on and it's going on all night and it's been on all day, how do you turn it off? So if we're in that anxious state, how do we turn it off? So self-soothing, you've noticed, you notice I've got a rubber band here, I'm doing this. This is part of self-soothing. So. There are different things that you can do to self-soothe. Um, we talked about some of those things earlier on, about very sensory ways to do that, to immerse yourself in, um, it mentions there about the five senses. Has anyone seen Stranger Things and Running Up That Hill? What's your Running Up That Hill song? Smile on that lady's face up there. What's your Running on that, Up That Hill song? Have you got one? <laughs> There's a lady there, no. Does anybody have a song that they like to listen to? Lady there. Love it. How does that go? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, thinking about music, what music do you like to listen to? Thinking about smell, is there cooking? Who likes to cook? Is that a way of really immersing yourself into something? Um, you know, smelling bread, wonderful smell. Coffee, tasting, again, it's around food, isn't it? Touching, so if you've got animals, you know, it's, it's a great way of self-soothing. Or, or being out in nature and you're picking up leaves and acorns and whatever they are, doing a bit of gardening, brilliant. And then as it mentions there, pictures, so photographs, that sort of thing. 
And then there are other examples there that aren't necessarily sensory, but um, it mentions there breathing deeply, journaling or keeping a diary, having a good cry, um, listening to music, grounding, so just absolutely being in that moment, sitting outside, taking your shoes off, sitting on the grass. Cognitive restructuring. So around, possibly a different way of putting that is maybe putting a different perspective on things, thinking about things a little bit differently. What else could that mean? Physical contact, a good hug, even if you hug yourself, that's a good thing. Exercise or physical activity, um, mindfulness, gardening, positive self-talk. So we just talked about that little chap on the shoulder, the Beetlejuice. So does anybody else have examples of, of their self-soothing, what they like to do? You sew. What do you sew? Four thousand masks. And when you're doing that, how quickly does this time fly? You do it every day. So that's a great example of mindfulness. It doesn't have to be sitting in a corner, gazing in the belly button. It's, it can be something that you lose yourself in, something that creates that state of flow or where you lose time. Something like doing a rubber band. So it doesn't have to be a big thing. Something that was mentioned there was self-talk. Um, and this is around what we say to ourselves. And Deb sort of mentioned around, you know, how do we talk about anxiety and, and you know, okay, today, if you look at the statement, it's in four quadrants. This is around what we call appreciative inquiry. So appreciating as opposed to depreciating or something that's depleted. If you think about your energy, if you're appreciating something, you feel sort of energized, something that's depreciative. How does that make you feel? Someone just mentioned earlier on about, you know, if someone says something to you and it's not particularly kind, you know, where does your energy lie then? It might be in your boots. Whereas if someone says, Sandra, that was brilliant down there. You were having a great time with that group next door lift you up. So appreciative. So this may not be the best example, but it's trying to sort of give you an idea of where we are and what we're saying, either to ourselves or to other people. Because the conversations, the words, the language we use, it really matters, whether that's to ourselves or to other people. So thinking about this first one, destructive conversations, I can't do this, I'm so useless. And then in terms of sort of questions or inquiry, what's the point? Why am I so useless? And then if you take that up, actually affirmative conversations. Today I walked for 10 minutes. Well done me. What might happen tomorrow if I walked for 15 minutes? Who else might walk with me? So there's an element of what's possible, what might happen, instead of something that's maybe more negative. It's a difference between, 
You know, even, even the words we say, they could be the same words, but the tone and direction. So it could be... Give me one moment. Or it could be... Give me one moment in time When I'm all I thought I could be I think I'm a, sort of giving you a little bit of an example. <laughs> so how we talk to ourselves, how we talk to other people, the tone that we use, the direction we use, what's possible? What can I do? instead of what can't I do, what's not possible. Think about the words that you're using, the language that you're using to yourself, but also to other people. And now we've got a little exercise. Let's just check for the next mm, probably 15 minutes. So, this is the I am living in the tree moment. No, it's, I am living in the moment tree, but you could be living in a tree. Um, living in a tree moment. I think I've just reinvented that. So on your, um, on your tables, you've got some flip charts, you've got some um, pens, you've got some post-its. What I'd love you to do is, um, this is a joint exercise because I, I can hear you saying, but I'm not creative. We're all creative, don't worry. Um, we've got plenty of pens and all sorts of other lovely things that you can use. Graham's been out to get some lovely pens. So I'd love you to draw this as a group on your table, on the flip chart, as it is there. I am living in the moment. Then I want you to put your post-its that you created earlier on as the, 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 um, the leaves around the tree. And these are some benefits of, of those moments. And then I want you to think about the roots and the nutrients that you need for your tree. Oh, I love how enthusiastic these people are. It's brilliant. They want to get started already. And the nutrients are these questions. Some of them you won't be able to probably do all of them, but I would love you to just answer some of them, the ones that you, that you really connect with. It might be your Stranger Things song, Running Up That Hill or whatever it is. But there are some other ones that might, might take you a little bit more time to think about that you want to write down or take a photograph of, that you want to do on your own at home or you might want to do it today, but all I would ask is that you do, you answer one of these questions and then you write it down on your, um, your tree, okay, as your nutrients. So if I talk to myself like my best friend, what advice would I give myself? Who do I like to spend time with? What's my favourite healthy food? I've been a bit mean there, if it is Ben and Jerry's, put down Ben and Jerry's. In what situations might I need to pause and breathe, as we just described? What activities are really important in my life and bring me joy, like sewing? Where is my happy place? What gives me energy? What one thing am I grateful for today? What things boost my mood? What music or song makes me feel good? If I asked a friend, what would they say I'm good at? What are my strengths? What are my superpowers? What exercise do I enjoy? What might I ask of someone else to help me prioritise my own needs? Asking for what we want and what we need to look after ourselves is a human right. We need to be able to do that. What are my beliefs and values that help me show up every day? Am I courageous? Do I have integrity? Do I feel love? Not just for other people, but myself. Am I kind? I might be kind to everyone else, but I may not have time to be kind to myself. And if that's your belief and your value, how true are you being to yourself? So, 
Give it a go. Write some um, down on your tree. Draw your tree. And we've got a few minutes to do this. Right, everybody. Sorry to interrupt your conversations, but I know you've got lunch on your mind as well, so, and going home. So I'm going to try and close up. So sorry to interrupt your conversations. Um, gosh, it went really, really quiet then. So we're going to wrap up. Would anybody like to share the experience of doing that exercise? What were your nutrients? There's a lady, what did you want to? Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? Blueberries, strawberries. We had the positivity and optimism. Positivity and optimism. <laughs> I think there's a lot of positivity and optimism in the room. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious of time, and the reason I picked these questions is they relate to something called PERMA. PERMA it was devised by someone called Martin Seligman in the States. He, by admission, is a depressive, he's a pessimist, and he wanted to know what made, or makes people happy. And he did a lot of research, and PERMA stands for Positive Emotion, Engagement, Relationships, Meaning, and Accomplishments. And I chose those questions to try and fit in with some of those five elements. So, I haven't just made it up. Um, but I hope that you enjoyed that exercise and I hope if you want to continue doing those and answering those questions at home, that would be great. Um, just one thing. I quite like this quote from um, Hugh Laurie. It's a terrible thing, I think, in life to wait until you're ready. I have this feeling now that actually no one is ever ready to do anything. There is almost no such thing as ready. There is only now. And you may as well do it now. Generally speaking, now is as good a time as any. So one thing, does anybody want to give their one thing that they have taken away from this session that they might do today or tomorrow? Lady here. Thank you. Do it now. Anybody else? <laughs> Stop being so anxious. Easier said than done, but thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? Pause, hold the moment. Taking a breath and even saying, can you just give me a moment? Let me just catch my breath. Thank you. Anybody else? The answer lies within yourself. Do you want to expand? It goes back to Viktor Frankl. We can't help what happens to us or on the outside, but our control and our freedom and our power is how we respond. And giving ourselves a little pause can help us maintain a little bit more control so that we can relate and connect in the way that we want to. Thank you. So. <laughs> Thank you.